We're going to continue our study with the gospel according to St. Luke, and I'll be reading from chapter 22, verses 7 through 23. I would ask the congregation please to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered a city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed." And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do it. Lord, we, we have heard the reading of the institution of the celebration of the Lord's Supper as recorded in the various Gospels. This is from the supervision of the Holy Spirit so that these words ring with truth, the very truth of God, and I pray that you will receive them as such and be seated. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, how grateful we are for the church that You have given to us, that it is Your church made up of Your people for whom You have given a perfect and complete atonement for their sins. We thank You for the covenant that is new in the evening that the church was born. And we thank You that our Lord had a passion for celebrating that event. And we thank You in His name. Amen. Jesus was stirred up. The Scriptures tell us that his spirit was moved deeply within himself as he began to feel more intensely, moment by moment, the weight that the Father had placed upon him to sacrifice himself for his people. He knew on this evening in which he celebrated the Passover with his disciples, that it was the last time he would ever celebrate that feast on this earth. He could see through the darkness and knew what was awaiting him on the morrow. Jesus understood the link between two very important festival occasions established by God in the Old Testament some six months apart. The most holy feast was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and probably the second most holy was the celebration of the Passover, 
Again, in Old Testament days, those two feasts were divided by some six months. But on this occasion, Jesus understood, as the only person in the world understood it at that time, that the celebration of Passover and the celebration of the Day of Atonement would be separated by less than 24 hours. Thursday night was Passover. Friday afternoon, the Day of Atonement. And there's a reason why these events were so closely linked. Now, to refresh your memory, let's look back to the book of Exodus, where we read this historical account in the 12th chapter, verse 7, then they shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of the raw or boiled in water, but roast it in its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that does remain, you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. You get the picture. The historic occasion for the instituting of the Passover. There had been a battle of powers. The most powerful superpower in this world, the Pharaoh of Egypt, and the most powerful being in the universe, the Lord God Omnipotent. And as these titans clashed on earth and in heaven, plague after plague after plague, and each time Pharaoh would surrender only to change his mind and to remain opposed to God and His providence until they reached the last plague. And God said to Pharaoh, on this night, I will send the avenger, my avenger, the angel of death, and I will appoint him to slay your firstborn, every last one of them, will I destroy. But then he made provisions to protect his people. He told Moses, and he said, look, you command the people to sacrifice a lamb and take the blood of that lamb and mark it on the doorposts and the lentils of your homes. Do not fail to mark every home in which your children dwell. And when I send the angel of death, of judgment on this world, wherever he sees the mark of the Lamb, he will pass over that place and no harm will befall my people. And then God commanded them to be ready. What they should eat, what they should drink, bitter herbs to remind them of the time they spent in slavery in Egypt. To drink the wine, celebrate this moment. To dress with their cloaks bound together by a belt that they would 
have their legs free to move in haste, and they would wear their sandals because when it's time to move from here out of slavery and into the promised land, you have to be able to move in haste and quickly. And I will take you home. And they believed it, at least for a moment, until they got between Migdal and the sea and found that they were being pursued by the mighty chariots of Egypt. And Egypt's chariots were behind them, and the roaring sea was in front of them. Moses' hands were raised as he prayed, and God created a huge wind to come in and make a remarkable effect, dividing the waters and drying a passageway for them, for the people of Israel to walk across on dry land. And as they began to walk, and finally the chariots of Israel began to pursue them, the Lord reversed that wind and drowned the chariots of Egypt. Well, the people of God who had experienced the Passover of the angel of death survived. This was the greatest act of redemption in all of the Old Testament. And so God said, don't ever, ever, ever forget this day. Every year at the appointed time, you must gather together and celebrate the Passover of the Lord. And when the son says to the father, why, oh, why, father, do we do this? The patriarch of the home will remind the people what the Lord has done to save them. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, without fail, Every Jewish person was involved in celebrating that memorial event of Passover. And from the time that he was a child, Jesus would go to Jerusalem and go up to the feast and celebrate this ancient ritual and memorial, first with his family and then with his disciples. And as his spirit groaned within him, he gave instructions to his disciples, find the place. I'll tell you how to find it, but we have to find a room that we can prepare the Passover. Because I want to celebrate the Passover one last time with you. Because I won't do it again until I enter into the kingdom. And so they went and found the place, and they went and prepared all of the elements for the Passover, and Jesus sat down and reclined, actually, at table with His disciples to celebrate the Passover. And they went through the various stages, the prayers, the wine, the singing of the halal, and then Jesus radically changed the liturgy. For centuries, the liturgy had been exactly the same until our Lord, who alone had the authority on heaven and earth, dared to change it, announced the establishing of a new covenant. He said, this is the new covenant now, which is in my blood. And that new covenant in my blood is by the shedding of my blood for the remission of your sins. Tonight, we're eating and drinking the ultimate Passover. I believe that was the birthday of the Christian church. In the upper room when Jesus initiated and instituted a new covenant, but the new covenant would still 
have to be ratified because covenants in antiquity had to be ratified in blood. This was the reason for the conjunction of Passover and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Because the next afternoon, the new covenant that Jesus instituted in the upper room was ratified by His blood. Now, just a word about the other memorial feast the one held to be most sacred among the Jews, the annual celebration of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where elaborate preparations were made among the priesthood and among the people. Animals were killed in preparation for this event. The high priest and the high priest alone was able to enter the Holy of Holies taking the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkling in it on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, which is the throne of God and contained within it Aaron's rod and the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. At the same time, the priest would place his hand on the scapegoat and symbolically transfer the sins of the people onto the goat and send the goat into the outer wilderness into the place of darkness, into the place of the curse for the remission of sins. The idea was atonement was made in satisfaction of the holiness of God in the Holy of Holies, while the removal of the people's sin was by virtue of the imputation of their sin to the back of the goat and sent into the outer darkness. It wasn't by accident that Jesus was killed outside the city of Jerusalem in a Gentile place, in the place of darkness, a place that was foreign to the holy presence of God as He was our scapegoat. But here's the irony. Every year, Yom Kippur was celebrated for centuries, the Day of Atonement the Day of Atonement this year, the Day of Atonement next year, the Day of Atonement the year after that. But here's the irony. In all of Jewish history, there's only one Day of Atonement. Not a single Day of Atonement in, celebrated in the Old Testament was in actuality a Day of Atonement. No atonement was made because the author of Hebrews tells us that the blood of bull and goats cannot atone for our sins. What was going on in the drama of Israel was a symbol, a symbol that pointed to a later full and perfect reality when the sins of God's people would be satisfied once and for all. And that Day of Atonement happened the day after Passover, when once for all the Lamb without blemish was sacrificed on the cross. And so Jesus changed the liturgy and established a new covenant in His blood. And He said, as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this wine, you will show forth My death until I come. Again, the atonement was prepared by centuries of ritual undertaken by animals whose blood was not worthy to atone for sins. But the people obeyed the symbol, and the symbol pointed not to a myth, but the full incorporation of the reality that was to come. So it is Christ in the upper room who is defined by sacred Scripture as being the Paschal Lamb, 
where the Scriptures say, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, so that when the angel of death would come, he would see the mark of the blood of the Lamb on the souls of His people. Ultimate Passover, followed by ultimate atonement, so that for us, for those who believe, who have put their trust in Christ and in Christ alone, will not have to atone for their own sins. And I remind you, dear friends, that the day you die, there will be a reckoning, there will be a judgment. And you will either atone for your own sins or you will receive the atonement that Christ made for your sins. The atonement that you seek to make by yourself will be worthless. It won't be worth as much as the blood of bulls or of goats. It will be futile. It will be useless. And as soon as he sees you, the angel of death will slay you. But for those who put their trust in Christ, his atonement will cover you today, tomorrow, and forever.